Hello, everyone. Uh, good evening. Welcome to our teleconference and to our Facebook Live. Um, if anybody's on, on Facebook and you could see me, just make a little note on bottom, please. Um, okay, we got it. We're on. Um, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our uh, teleconference and Facebook Live session. And we're talking about um, Yom Yom Tovim and children who have abandoned religion. And I really, I want to start by um, thanking all of you for joining and by really commending you on having the courage to do things differently. You know, we, we're used to doing things a certain way, thinking a certain way, and it's hard to change, to embrace different thought. So I really, I, I commend you for being open to, to learning and exploring and um, having a family relationship, you know, over the course of Yantif, this, um, tele this teleconference and, and talk is dedicated in honor of my parents, uh, Shlomo Yaakov Moshe Levi and my father who passed away very young and um, would have done nothing, would have loved nothing more than to spend time with his children, however they were. And um, my mother, Aleh Shalom Bela Basar Moshe David and Shlomo Yaakov, Shlomo Ben, Shlomo Zeven Baruch Yehuda, the wonderful man who married my mother and they lived together for 46 years in an environment where all kids were accepted and loved unconditionally. It should be as chus for all the neshamas. Okay, so we're going to go through a progression of a few thoughts. I'd like to first talk about people who abandon religion. What's the reason for it? What are reasons? And, and, and what you need to know as parents, I, I think there's, there's an important piece of that. Um, and then I, I would like to make the case why it is that children belong at home and why is it that I, I passionately believe with every fiber in my body that no matter what happens, children should always be welcomed at home. They should always have a place despite the challenges and all the questions of what do, you, what do we tell the other children and how do we make it work and we'll get to some of them and I'll be glad to take some questions. Um, towards the end, I'll invite those of you who are on FaceTime to post uh, questions in the comments, and I'll try to take them as best I can. Uh, so why, why do people leave religion? And I, I think it's important for you as parents, as family members, to understand the difference between people who abandon just religion and people who abandon life and religion at the same time. Um, the people who abandon life, when children are doing things to harm themselves, that God, you know, they're doing hard drugs or they're, God forbid, cutting or a suicide attempt or they're terribly sad, um, very, very often that's trauma related. And I wouldn't even, honestly, if you have a child like that, if a child had been abused or something, is, things are really, really wrong and they're angry at God and they, and they, they just are not into religion, honestly, it's irrelevant at that point. The religion takes a back seat to their emotional health. And your job as parents, I would respectfully suggest, is to get them whole, to see that they're happy and they're comfortable and they're enjoying their lives. And it, really, honestly, if that's the case, the religious component of it really is not the issue. Um, and, and everything that you could do to make them comfortable and enjoying their life is one in the win column. Um, but kids abandon religion for many other reasons. Some of them just were never turned on in the first place. Some of them see inconsistencies in our world and there's no society that's perfect. And uh, for many of them, it's a phase. Uh, for, as I said, some of them are, are not interested and will never be interested. But I think it's important to, to step back a little bit and talk about the, the, the free choice that God gave us, why people make mistakes. I, I'd like to spend, obviously we're gonna spend some time in, practically in the real world. I would like to spend a few minutes um, discussing philosophy, discussing hashkafa. What's this all about? Why did God give us free choice? No organization runs with free choice. Your homes don't run with, with complete free choice. Uh, we drive on roads that we, we don't have free choice. There's order to everything. Why did God give us free choice? I ask you another question. Why is it that uh, kids between the age of 13 and 20, exactly adolescence, 
and girls from 12 to 20, they're, they're Pater Bedine Adam and Chay, uh, Pater Bedine Shemayim and Chayev Bedine Adam. That means that if they transgress to a fellow human, let's say somebody throws a rock through your window, um, and he's 15 years old, he's liable, he, he must pay for it from his own money. If not, Bezdin in the time when there was a rabbinic court, they would force him to go to work and pay it off. Um, but if they transgress against God, if they don't keep Shabbos, or they, uh, the, they're Pater Bedine Hashem says, you're, you're, uh, you're not obligated until age 20. So what's that all about? I'll tell you my understanding of it, and I think it might give you comfort as parents, um, especially those uh, of, of your children are struggling with faith. I think that God gave us free choice because at the end of the day, the only way we learn is from our mistakes. That's just the way it is. You, you refrain from investing in a speculative thing, or putting too much money in one of those because you lost money there. And you, you, uh, you, know, you wear a, a coat during the winter. Your, parent, your mother may have told you many, many times um, to wear it, but you know something? When you get sick once, that's, that's much more than anything else. And a lot of, in fact, a lot of the kids that get into drinking, one of the things that stops them from consuming large amounts of alcohol is when they get sick and violently sick. And very often that's a better lesson than anything else. So God created us to become better people. And when we're children, we don't have, we don't have impulse control and we, we, we have to live life. I believe that Hashem gave us this the period of adolescence for people to make their mistakes and for parents to help them through it. They should make their mistakes while they're in their homes. You know, that's why I'm so opposed to banning things. When you, um, when you forcibly ban kids from doing things, we're essentially saying is, uh, you can't do this, you can't do that, not giving them any free choice at all. First of all, when they hit 20, 22, and they have free choice, they're emotionally unequipped for it. And in addition to that, um, you, you've given them their mistake time when they're adults and their stakes are much higher. Um, and I'll tell you a fascinating uh, conversation that I had with Rav Shmuel Kamenesky Shlita, who's our Paisek. Uh, he's been our rabbinic advisor for Project Yes for the past 20 years. I'm forever grateful to him for his time and his guidance. And I once asked him, I got a call from a, a 17, a parent of a seven, father of a 17-year-old who lived in Flatbush, Brooklyn. And the father was a very serious yeshiva guy, or sounded like just a wonderful human being and very serious about religion, about his Yiddishkeit. And he called me up to tell me that a 17-year-old came home from school that day. And he told him, he said, you know, Ta, Dad, um, I really don't believe anything they're telling me in school. Okay? He, he's a top learner. He was acing every one of his exams in, in Gemara and everything else. But he said that I just don't believe what they're telling me. I don't believe what they're telling me in school. So I said, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to ask Rav Shmuel Kamenetsky what he thought. I, I wanted to pose the question to Rav Shmuel Kamenetsky and say, what should a father answer his kid when a child says, I don't believe that Hashem gave the Torah and I don't believe that the, God split the sea. I don't believe any of it, even though he's a great kid and a serious learner. Um, so I said, you know what, let me ask Rabbi Kamenetsky, I'll ask Rav Shmuel. But before I hang up, I just want to tell you that you're an amazing father because very few kids would feel comfortable enough telling this to his father, to their father. And, and um, I hung up, took his number. Um, I, called, I called up Shmuel Kamenetsky and I was expecting him to answer one of a few things that I had thought of at the time. And Shmuel just blew me away. He said as follows, this is a direct quote. He said, David HaMelech says, Yemei Shnei Seinu Behem Shivim Shana. We say in Tehillim, we say in the davening Friday night, that our, our sojourn, our time in this world is 70 years. And so he said, well, what's, what, how does that get into the picture? And what's God, what's the message? So Rav Shmuel said that God put us here for 70 years and hid his presence from us. And it's our, our goal in life, a very challenging goal, to find God and to find spirituality and to find uh, a meaning in life. So, Rav Shmuel said, tell your son he has 53 years to go. D direct quote. Tell him, he, so as he was saying, it's not a no, it's a not yet. 
Um, so he was telling the kid, you're 17 years old. If you don't believe in God yet, you have time to explore. And I think it's comforting for us as parents, if we think of it, it's not always like that. Obviously, many of us have, many people have adult children who, who are not observant. Um, but think of it in those terms. It's not forever. And there are so many things that you may not know and might not understand. So be patient with your children. Be patient with them. Um, and if they're not observant at the time or they're rejecting religion for one reason or another, really be patient with them. Uh, my Rebbe Rav Tams, that's how I used to say, that um, educators are compared to stars. Yeah, there's a Pasuk uh, verse uh, to support that, that educators are compared to stars. And Rebbe said <clears throat> that a star, the light that a star produces, we know uh, some stars, the closest star is four light years away. What does that mean? That the, the, the light that we see now was produced over four years ago, and it took time to get here. So that's what Rebbe said. The messages that you give your children, they're not old enough to appreciate them. So don't be frustrated if they don't listen to you, if you don't see the result, but they are listening to you. Be patient, Rebbe used to say. Be patient and, and give it time. Um, just one more story to illustrate the point. I, had a, I have a friend of mine who's just a, a big Tamil Chacham, a Torah scholar, a great guy, a very successful businessman. And he called me quite a few years ago and he asked me what to do with his 18-year-old son. I have an 18-year-old son who absolutely refuses to go to shul on Shabbos. He's completely observant in every other, other way. Just, excuse me, just he refused to go to shul on Shabbos, to pray in synagogue. So I, he asked me what to do. So I said, how long has this been going on? He said, six months. So I said, tell him good Shabbos and go to shul. He said, and I shouldn't like, push him to go. I said, what does he do? He says, he sits on the couch. And when I say come to shul, he says, good Shabbos, dad, five, six times and refuses to go. So I said, why would you do something if it's not working? Just leave the house. So he did, and he called, he's really hysterical. He called me right before Shabbos started, a few weeks later. And he said, Yankee, I did what you told me to only because you said so. It made no sense to me. It's against everything I believe in to walk out of the house and leave him there. So he said, so, so why are you, um, he said, what, you know, what, why did you tell me to do this? Please explain it to me. So I told him, I said, you know, I was younger at the time. I said, you know, whatever, I'm 45 years old. I said, I know that there's going to come a time in life that I'm going to have to be much, much more careful with what I eat. I don't have to yet. So I exercise every day religiously and, and I try to take, make good choices, but I'm not completely as careful with my intake, food intake as I will be in 10, 20 years from now. So I'm kind of enjoying it now. I know there's going to be a time that it, it's going to end. And so many kids feel that way about religion. They're younger right now. They plan on settling down and, and um, you know, staying observant, but they... You know, they're just not ready yet. That, so be patient. And with the full understanding that there are, um, there are people that are going to leave religion and stay away. And that if, if your child might be one of those. And, and that's what I'd like to talk about. About making the case for why is it um, that our children should be welcome at home. And what do we tell the other children? And what's the reason for this? And how does it work? How do I explain it to my other children? So, number one, I wanna make a moral case. Families are a, a, a unit and families should stay together. Um, kids have been disappointing their parents since the beginning of time. Um, Hashem created his first two children were Adam and Chava and they, and they sinned the first immediately right after creation Adam and Chava's children were Cain and Hevel right um, and it, it's been like this our Avos our uh, patriarchs were not and matriarchs were not spared from having children that were that were challenging um, and, and it, it's our job to love them, to be patient, to be tolerant, and to help guide them through life. 
I once had a fascinating conversation with Rabbi Orlowick, my dear friend Rabbi Noach Orlowick, who lives in Eretz Yisrael. And we're very close friends, we finish each other's sentences. And um, I, we, we were doing a session together on adolescence, and as we were about to start, he tells me, he says, Yanki, you're not going to believe what one of my kids did. He said, I, I was sitting um, at, at a table, a uh, Shabbos table, I had guests over at the table in Yerushalayim in Jerusalem, and he said one of my sons, who was at the time 16, 17, a teenager, um, started to take off trumas and maestras from the food that he was given, from the fruits and vegetables. Um, in, in, in Eretz Yisrael, there was a custom to take a, to take a percentage of the food off, um, it was called truma. Anyway, what he basically was saying is, my father doesn't do things according to halacha, according to Jewish law, and I'm much more stringent than my father is. And in front of the guests, he was basically hanging up a sign that Rabbi Orlovic doesn't know what he's doing, and I'm doing it better than he is. So I asked him, I said, so what, so what did you do? So he said, I laughed, he's a teenager. Teenagers have to express themselves. So I asked him, okay, that was easier because he was doing something that was more intensely religious than what you than your place in life what would you do if he was far less observant how about if he came to the Shabbos table without a kippah without a yarmulke what would you do then and he was he was quiet for a very long minute and he said that would be much harder and he very softly said I hope that Hashem would give me the wisdom to do the right thing which would be to just let him be um, so that's the first thing. Just you're you're a family, and we're supposed to be patient with our children, regardless. And, and the second thing is, what message are we sending? If a, a child is not allowed to come into our homes because they're not religiously observant, whether it's teenagers at home, um, someone going through a phase, as I said, or someone is settled in life, a child, an, an adult child is married or unmarried, and they're they're completely not observant. I mean, what's the message? What's the message that we're more religious so we don't let our kids come home? I mean, think of it, think about it. Um, what, what kind of message does that send? And, and, and what kind of uh, conditional love is that? I mean, imagine uh, uh, what the message that we tell our other children, people are always concerned, rightly so, and I'm not, make, I'm not minimizing it in any way. It's, it's, a, it's, it's very painful and, and, and you know, stressful. I, I really get it. Um, but when we keep take, when we don't let a child in our home, what we're really saying is to telling the other kids that if you're not going to be religious, we're not going to let you in the house either. What kind of message is that? That that we're telling our children that the love is conditional on their embracing religious life. I mean, so how would we feel if our spouses loved us conditionally on how much money we earned or anything else? Um, and I think there really needs to be a message of of acceptance. I think parents should be honest with the other children, and I think the other, we say that we're a family unit, they say, how come, you know, Yassi is, is not keeping Shabbos or whatever. I think that, don't lie to them, be honest with them. Sit down and say, look, we would give any child whatever they needed, and whatever you would need, we would do for you. And this child needs our patience right now and our tolerance and our love and we would do the same for you if you would be going through a phase through a challenging phase and that's why at the beginning i differentiated between kids who were who were unhappy and abandoning life and doing self-destructive things with them there's really nothing to even talk about uh, the kids understand it you know when a child is struggling i once had a, a very interesting story a, a friend of mine called me he was having a terrible difficulty with a daughter and I kept advising him, leave her at home and be tolerant and stay in the game and do what you got to do as a parent. And then he, he called and he asked me as follows. His in-laws lived a plane ride away. And his in-laws were extremely patient and tolerant. They, this guy lived right in the middle of a very orthodox community. So there was a lot of peer pressure and pressure from the community. And <clears throat> he, want, he, he asked... If he and his wife thought it would be a great idea to send the daughter away to the, to the grandparents where she could chill out a little bit and be herself and be smothered in the unconditional love that grandparents can give. So he asked me what should he do with the other children? How should he explain to the kids 
that this young lady, who was not doing well in school and flunking out and, and giving them a very, very hard time at home, why does she get a privilege of getting a plane ticket when they have to stay home with their parents? So we discussed a few strategies. Anyway, call me the next day. He said, you know, I sat down with my kids and I started to hem and haw and I said, look, you know, we had to get her a plane ticket. I really want you to understand. In middle of this discussion, one of the kids said, Tati, Dad, you don't need to explain it to us. We know that Rifki's unhappy right now. We know she's going through a hard time. We're happy. She's unfortunately not. Of course she should get a plane ticket. Kids get it. The children get it. They understand what's going on. And I think by being tolerant and being patient, you're really giving them a life lesson. Um, and there's another component to it. Um, my mother... Uh, you know, went through a very challenging time in her life. Uh, she didn't have children for 10 years, and then she had three young kids, um, and her husband passed away. And I, I learned so many lessons from watching her and watching her, her attitude to life and everything. And, and one thing I found fascinating about her, and she never really spoke about it, but it was so obvious, that people who were kind to her during her difficult phases, she could never do enough for them. She was eternally in their debt, went to every one of their weddings, even if they w weren't related, you know, the marriages of their children. Um, she was so grateful to anyone who was kind to her when she needed it. Um, in fact, I once, you know, I once drove her to a wedding in a, in a very, very, uh, just a horrible weather night. And the individual wasn't directly related to us, it was a cousin's cousin. And I said, Ma, like, why are you going? Why are you schlepping an hour each way to this wedding? And she just quietly said, she rang my bell every morning. And she was saying that she appreciated her help and her support. Um, so your child is struggling. They're struggling with faith. They're struggling in other ways. Uh, imagine what it would feel like to them if they felt they didn't have your support. That's not a disappointment that goes away. That's a disappointment that stays forever. And, you know, my mother's attitude really was, she was never, she was the classiest lady. But she, when people were kind to her, like, her attitude was, I, again, she never expressed it, but it was clear that this is the way she thought. She said, like, I don't need you now. I needed you when I was in need. Now, imagine what a child would feel like on the plus side if parents are... Uh, gracious and, and, and kind and patient when they're going through a struggle and the other way around. Um, and one more point, and I, I was debating whether I should even mention this, but I think it's important. So what, I said it was a candid discussion. Um, so I'll be candid, uh, like I always am, but a little more so. 50, 75 years ago, the world was a far less tolerant place. That's just the way it was. That's just the way it was. Um, I, we lived, my parents moved to Bell Harbor. M most of the kids, the, most of the kids on the block were, were not Jewish and nobody was religious. I used to get my yarmulke swiped off. We got into fights on the bus, not with my immediate neighbors. I mean, today would be a, a full page headline. You know, people were, were rougher. Um, people were more likely to marry their own kind. You know, Italians would marry Italians and African-Americans would marry. Obviously, there were exceptions, but certainly not like it is today. The world is a much more tolerant place now. And I propose to you that for many, the tolerance is a religion. Intolerance is apicursus, is, is heresy. And I, I, I propose to you, again, this is a more pedestrian reason, but I propose to you that when we are intolerant to our children, um, it won't come across that way. It won't come across as a principled stand that you're taking because of religion. Um, it will just come across as being harsh and unyielding and, and, and intolerant. Um, so I don't even think it, it'll be understood. You know, I, I, we, my wife and I volunteer, we spend 
um, Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur for Rav volunteering for a wonderful organization called Madregos that, that support, they support, um, Madrega is a step in Hebrew, they support kids going through, and adults going through 12-step recovery programs. And they have several hundred uh, people joining for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur who are uh, going through various stages of addiction. Those kids are so accepting of each other. I can't even begin to tell you. Nobody cares. Nobody cares what their background is. Nobody cares what the level of religious observance. All right, you know, they're in recovery, so they're, they're desperate for, for support. Um, and in that environment, they support each other throughout. Shouldn't we as religious settled people be doing the same? You know, I tell, I, I, this, the, two years ago on Rosh Hashanah, I had the, the funniest story. I mean, it wasn't that funny at the time, but I was, I was davening, I was praying on Rosh Hashanah, and I got very emotional during davening, and I kind of put my head down and I was crying. And three young men came to me in the course of a few minutes, uh, two of them just patted me silently on the back and walked by, letting me know that they had the support. And the third one, a eight, 17, 18-year-old kid, taps me on the shoulder. He says, hey, listen, Rabbi, I'm here for you. <laughs> I'm here for you, Rabbi. I'll be here all Rosh Hashanah. If you want to talk, I'm here. And, you know, that's what the atmosphere is like. And I propose to you that if your kid is rebellious and having a hard time or going through an addiction phase or anything like that, they're getting unconditional support from other areas in their life. I said again, this is the most pedestrian reason. I think the real reason to do it is because uh, we, we, we should be accepting of our children. Um, but, but these are some other reasons. Um, what do we do with the, with the other children and what do we do with other family members? I'll take a few, I got a few practical questions um, and I, I'll take um, I'll read some of them and I'm going to, if anybody's again on Facebook and wants to, to put some questions up, I'll be glad to answer them in the time that we have. Um, I can tell you that over the years and dealing with thousands and thousands of families and kids who were struggling and people who were not, weren't observant, um, this is what works, especially if you're taking the long view, the long-term view. When you cut off a relationship with a child, you're cutting off the relationship with them. And you know, it doesn't always repair itself when you're ready to have it repaired. Um, it, it, you know something, our youngest just got married. Um, I can almost guarantee you, if you're 30 years old and principled and, and thinking that this has to be the way because of this, I can almost guarantee you that you're gonna regret it when you're my age. Um, people my age very rarely regret being too lenient. People my age regret being too strict. And, you know, one final thought, and then I'll take the questions, and, and the kids want to participate in religion. I, I mentioned it yesterday in a class that I gave to YU Smicha students. Um, people, many people, if you're on the outside, you, don't understand, you wouldn't understand this. There are lots of parts of our Jewish experience the culture, the food, the camaraderie, the closeness, that may irritate them while they're in the community. But people who abandon religion and leave the community, many of them love certain components of it. And they would like to participate on their terms. I got a phone call, many of the people, you know, there's a new genre of books of, of people who used to be religious and, and, and weren't, and. Some of them actually are, are fantastic writers. Um, I'm friendly on a personal level with many of them and, and um, I, I value my relationship with them. So one of these people who, who again, a young man, uh, not religious, he was living in Soho at the time, you know, in Manhattan. And he called me up one morning, cold call, and he said, Rabbi Horowitz, I gotta tell you something. You know, he said, I'm totally disconnected from the religious world. It's, it's totally out of my, uh, you know, out of my wheelhouse right now. But I got to tell you, he said, I'm sitting on the stoop outside. He, a guy came from a Hasidish community. He said, I'm sitting on the stoop outside my apartment, my condo, and the whole building is emptying out. Everybody's going to work. And I tell every one of them, hey, how you doing? And everybody, like, looks at me like I'm weird, waves and just moves on. And he said... I'm waiting for somebody to say, Niv is Herzog, in Yiddish, like, hi, what's up? Because, you know, and it, it was fascinating, you know, he, he was missing that cultural closeness that he had in the community. 
why shouldn't the non-religious child of ours have this experience to come and participate during a time of Yantif? And, and my experience, again, in dealing with thousands and thousands of people who abandoned religion, they respect people who are truly religious, non-judgmental, sincere, honest, with integrity and, and kind. They deeply respect them. Um, one last story before I take your questions. I was in Los Angeles for Shabbos, and I was communicating with a, a few people who had a, abandoned religion. One of them was having a very difficult time with the custody issue, and I was trying to help out. And I responded to an email of his. In other words, he was on the East Coast, so whatever, it was 6 o'clock. So Shabbos, let's say, it was 6.30. So uh, 7.30, 8 o'clock, I emailed him back. And he, he sent me an email. Rabbi, you too? Meaning that I also abandoned religion. He thought I was emailing him on Shabbos. And I called him up. I laughed. I said, you know, I'm on the West Coast. It's not Shabbos for me yet. I said, I want to ask you something. Would you, be, would you have been happy if you found out that I became non-observant? Would you say, great, we got another one? Or would you say, oh, I didn't believe Horowitz would do that. And he said the latter. He laughed and he said, you know, I wouldn't be that thrilled if you'd become non-religious. So, you know, overall, enjoy your family. Life is too short. Make accommodations. Um, you're giving your children the most beautiful message of tolerance and acceptance. Um, you know, our Rebbe Rav Pam, our great Rebbe, was constantly speaking to us about giving 10% uh, of our time to weaker students. That was something we always heard from him. And it became part of the culture of our yeshiva. And, and what he was telling us is, don't be elitist. He, he always said that Rebbe, um, Rebbe said that, um, working people have money and they have to give a miser. They have to give a tenth of their money. Uh, you don't have much money, um, so your currency is your time. 10% of your time has to go to work with weaker students. And that was a message of tolerance. It wasn't just a message of learning with somebody. It was a message th that we shouldn't be elitist and we should reach out to other people um, who, who are struggling or, or going through difficult times. And I was a beneficiary of this. I, I really was not a good student at all in high school. Do you know who my big brother, um, you know, Chafrusas were, who took an interest in me? Rabbi Berliner, who's the principal in Pesach Yeshiva, Rabbi Yisrael Reisman, who's the, the Rav, uh, the very well-known rabbi in, in Flavish, who gives all the Navi Shiorim, Rabbi Shachni Weinberger, who's a Rosh Yeshiva today. These are the folks who took out, when they were a year or two older than me, to take out time from their schedule. So, uh, to, to learn with me. And that was part of the culture that we got from our Rebbe. And, and I believe that when parents you know, you can't fool kids. They, they see that you're struggling and it's difficult for you to watch um, your children uh, not being observant. Uh, you know, on a practical level, I do think it's important and it's helpful if you can. It depends on your relationship. If your relationship is very strained, I would tell you just invite them and don't say anything. Um, if your relationship will support it, you might want to ask them, look, we have grandkids around. Would you be kind enough to wear a kippah in the house? Um, you know, would you do me a favor? I know you're smoking or chatting on the phone. Please not in front of the family. Go, go, to, your, go to your bedroom. You know, you may want to say that. And, you know, one of the people, um, one of the uh, um, pa a parent at a workshop, I, I did a workshop with parents whose children were no longer observant. And this is one of the things that I mentioned. And one of them said, you know, I... We, our kids are coming for Shabbos. I'm a non-religious couple, and, and their our grandkids are coming for Shabbos. Um, can I tell them about, about, let's say, wearing a yarmulke or not doing the phone? So I said, if you had one thing to say, what would it be? I said, think about it that way. The first thing you say, in all likelihood, they'll probably listen. Don't tell them six things. Because when you say six things wrong about somebody, you know, to change six things, you're really saying, <laughs> I don't like any part of you. 
<laughs> so, you know, keep your criticism to a minimum and be patient. Again, as I said, this is what I see over the course of time, that that's what's helpful. Um, a parent just sent in, you know, how do you speak to a, a boy who's angry at Hashem and angry at Rabbanim that let him down? Um, it's very sad. Um, and again, I'm encouraging parents to put in, to, to put their, um, you know, post your questions. If a child is angry with God, let them express it. It's okay if they're angry with God. I do grief counseling, you know, when, when, when people, uh, God forbid, lose relatives. This is part of the human experience. Um, you might, this story might be helpful. There's a story from the Barditchev Rebbe, Rabbi Yitzchak of Barditchev, who was known to be the defense attorney of Klal Yisrael. He always tried uh, to find the best in, in people. And the story is told that he walked into shul one day, into the synagogue, and there was a, a poor uh, peasant, a farmer, uh, went to the Aron Kodesh, went to the Holy Ark, he tore open, he tore, he ripped aside, he pulled aside the, the covering, the proches, the covering uh, of the Ark of the Aron Kodesh. He opened up the Aron Kodesh and, it, and the exposed Sifrei Torah, the Torah scrolls were there, and um, he started yelling at God in the first person. Um, I saw the story written down in, in a number of places. Uh, and he started yelling at God in the first person. It, this man's cow had died. And um, he started yelling in the first person. He says, God, why you take my cow from me? I have no money. You know, there's rich guys in town who have hundreds of animals. Why don't you take one of theirs? You had to take my cow. It's the only... I gave milk and it helped us work around the farm, but, you know, the house or whatever. How could, how could you do this to me? He started screaming at him. So the people in the shul were, were aghast at his disrespect and, and went to forcibly yank him out of shul. And the Baditch of Varav said that I envy his relationship with God because he's comfortable talking to him in the first person, even if he expresses anger. And when children are going through difficulty, um, they're angry. That's what, it, that's what it is. They're angry at us. You know, as parents, sometimes the kids express their anger towards us. It, it is what it is. That's, that's part of their experience. I think, I, I'm not saying you should encourage them to be angry at God, but understand it at least. Um, I went to a shiva call with Rabbi Tendler, Rabbi Moshe Tendler, who's the son-in-law of Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, and he told me just a profound thought that he heard from his father-in-law. His father-in-law, uh, Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, went to visit a, a, a shiva home with Rabbi Tendler, uh, you know, 50 years ago or whatever it was. And he walked into the house and he asked the following question. He said that we make, we have two blessings that we make. We make, there's a die and a emes that we make at a funeral when sad news happen. God is a just, uh, an honest judge uh, that we accept the God's din upon us, the God's judgment that we lost this relative. And we make a, a shechiyonu or tova metiv when there's good news, when, when we're, we celebrate something. So Rav Moshe said, listen to this, Rav Moshe asked the mourners, he said, we're supposed to believe that everything God does is good for us. Right? That's part of our faith, that God does everything that we need. So, if that's the case, so why don't we make a shechianu or a tova metiv? Why don't we make a happy bracha when a relative dies? Because we should believe that it's good. It's good for us. So Rav Moshe said that the Torah was giving us a message. We know what we're supposed to be thinking. And we also know that we're human beings and we're in pain and we're not feeling Shechianu and Tova Metev right now. We're feeling dynamis. We feel like mourning. And Rav Moshe said that the Torah gave us the liberty to understand that although we're supposed to think a certain way, we're not there. And why is that not a good message for a child to, to, to know that, that it's okay to be upset and it's even okay to be upset, you know, if, if they're angry at things that happened. Um, I think dialogue is important and your ear is important, that they should always know that they can talk to you about things. Um, here are two questions that I got today. Um, one is that one, a parent, grandparents wrote that they have two families. Um, one of the families is extremely observant and 
the second family, much less so. And the kids want to, the, the grandparents wanted to know what should they do with their grandchildren who are in the very Haredi, in the Orthodox family. They, they bring full notebooks with Divrei Torah, with Torah thoughts that they want to relate at the Seder table. Um, the other people at the table are going to be, you know, uh, bored, turned off, like they're just listening to this, that they they're seem to be uh, um, barely religious or not religious. Um, and they asked, you know, what should, how do you balance the needs? And, you know, my response to that would be, I think, I think with honesty, I think you just, you could do it a number of ways. One way would be to sit down with the kids who brought their notebooks and listen to them at other meals, or to obviously do some at the Seder, uh, tell them they could say two thoughts each at the Seder and you listen during the other meals. You could do it in the afternoon. You could do it on Chalamoid. It doesn't necessarily have to be when the other family is there. And, and you know, uh, and the, uh, the other way to handle it would be uh, to tell the other, you know, the, the family that's not observant or less observant that um, we're going to be spending about 20 minutes now, you know, in a more... Um, in gross discussion over the Haggadah. Maybe if whoever wants to take a break, now would be a good time. So look, when you start with the understanding that we're a family and we're together and we're going to stay together and we're going to make it work, the answers all come by themselves. Um, I have a son-in-law who's no longer observant. How do I answer my granddaughter? Um, my daughter is trying to, my daughter is in the marriage, committed to it and doing her best to deal with her husband's lack of religion. What do I do when my granddaughter says, my dad's not that Jewish anymore? <sighs> Honesty with everything. Uh, obviously she knows it. She wants to hear what you're going to say. Um, I think you say we love him. He's part of our family. He's your father. You respect him and you love him. And you know, something of that nature. Um, I'm going to wrap it up unless we have any questions. Um, I'm going to wrap it up now with, with a short about Torah and uh, something that was so powerful to me. It was told to me by my good friend, P.G. Waxman. Um, if any of you are interested, I wrote an article in Mishpacha magazine um, about 10 years ago. Should we, um, the title is, should we uh, keep our at-risk teen at home. That was the title. And, and parents wrote, uh, you know, a question to me describing their child and how difficult he is at home and should they, people are telling them that he's going to be a bad influence on the other kids, um, should he leave the house? And you can look up the column. It's on my website also. Just if you do Google search Yaakov Horowitz, at-risk teen, send away from home, it should come up. Um, and I wrote what basically what I'm saying now is that keep them in the family and, and you know, everything like that. So my good friend, uh, P.G. Waxman from Lakewood, Pinchas Waxman, sent me the following thought. We have Chazal, our sages tell us, um, whether, you know, we understand it metaphorically or literally, Kishachotu Yisrael, there will come a time, this is the text of the Maimer Chazal, of the, of the, rabbinic literature. Um, and it says as follows, Kishachatu Yisrael, there will come a time when the Jews will sin and God will go to Avram Avinu, to Abraham, to our patriarch. And he's going to say, Banecha Chatu, your children sin. And Avram is going to answer him, so, you know, you're God. <laughs> you're God. Do what you gotta do. You know, punish them. Um, I don't know, do what you... What do you want from me? God's going to go to Yaakov. Same thing. Your children sinned. And Yaakov gives a similar answer. He goes to Yitzchak and he says, and Yitzchak pushes back. Yitzchak, the quote of the Chazal, is, the quote is as follows. He says, God, are they... Are they my children? He said, your children sinned. He said, are they my children and not yours? They're your kids too, God. So, forgive them. We'll both pray for them. Pal Geli, Pal Gelecha will split, so to speak, the sin, figuratively speaking, and we'll make it work. That's the, that's the message. 
And he, he, so my friend asked, he said, Yitzchok was the din person. Yitzchok, Avram was known to be super kind. Yitzchok was more no nonsense. So he should have been the one to send, to, to, to not defend the Jews. Avram should have been the one. He said something so, so beautiful and so profound. He said that Avram had Yishmael. And even though the truth is, those who would argue that people should send the kids away from home say that God told Avram to listen to Sarah and they sent Yishmael away. The flip of that is, look how much we've suffered from Yishmael over the years, right? You know, there's a, there's a, there's a other side to that. Um, but Avram, in any event, Avram had, a, had difficulty with Yishmael and he sent him away. Yaakov didn't have that nisayon, he didn't have that test. All of his children were on the straight and narrow, even though he also struggled with their adolescence in many different ways. And they sinned and he really looked the other way, um, to a great degree, like Rashi says. But Yitzchak tells God, he said, Hashem, I had Esav in my house. I never threw him away. I kept him and I loved him despite the fact that he was, he was um, burning incense and sacrifices to idols while he was in my house, as Rashi says. I kept him. In fact, it's fascinating. You look, Esav wants to kill Yaakov, so Yitzchak sends Yaakov away. He should have sent Esav away, right? But Yitzchak says, no, I kept my son Hashem. Don't. Just because they sin, don't throw them away and say, Banei, your children, don't give up on them. Are they your children and not mine? God, you also, I had mercy and I loved my Esav, you're going to love your Jewish children also. And I always say that when, um, when the Jews are in need of prayers, I think the best people to pray um, for us are parents who love the kids unconditionally. So I really, from the bottom of my heart, I wish you only mazel, all of you, to have a wonderful yantif. Um, celebrate together with your family. I hope that, uh, you know, things go well for you. I really would encourage you to explore it. I could almost tell you, almost guarantee you won't regret it. Um, my email is yhprojectgues at gmail. I will do my very best, if anybody has questions on this, to be able to try to respond before Yantif if you do have any practical questions. I, I don't always get to my emails, so I can't promise, but I really, really will try to set aside time before Yantif, um, to, to, before Pesach, to be able to respond to your questions. Hashem should give you all mazel and bracha and nachas from your families. Thank you very much.